Hello, good evening, and welcome to Michael Corrin Live on, of course, CTS. And thank you for your kind words about the show last night. Um, yes, I, I did survive. It was very heated. But, uh, you know, politics, what's the definition? Uh, what are we to do? What shall we do? It is about passion. And uh, sometimes it can even be anger. It shouldn't be. It should be passion and, and dedication and commitment. But I think you saw a lot of that last night. Uh, I, I don't know. I was, I was impressed. Uh, the subject tonight is certainly one that does provoke, must, should provoke passion, because it's a subject which, uh, well, has to concern us all. I mean, I, I've got four children, but even if I did, didn't have any children, that really wouldn't be an issue. It, it's about children, and they are vulnerable, they are the innocent, and they are the ones who are hurt first. We're talking about child poverty. Is it an issue in this country? If it is an issue, what do we do about it? Our panel tonight, on my on my far left is Robert Metz from the Freedom Party of Ontario. Welcome to you, sir. Michael. Uh, and the Freedom Party is a, what, a libertarian party? We're a provincially registered party in the province of Ontario that uh, basically believes that the purpose of government is to protect the individual's freedom of choice right. and, and to insist that individuals are essentially responsible for their okay. actions. All right, and we'll learn more sure. later. Laurel Rothman, the National Coordinator of Campaign 2000. Welcome to you. Hello. Close to my close right here is uh, Chito Agalefo. Yes, uh, a single mom and president of Mothers Against Poverty. Welcome to you. Hello. And on my right is Paul Zabo, MP for Mississauga South, of course, in the Liberal Party, because there aren't many who aren't Liberals in this province. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's begin with you, in fact, Mrs. Zabo. Um, first of all, child poverty in Canada? Surely not. Yes. Tell yes. us about it. Well, um, certainly um, there have been a lot of different measures. I don't think we've defined poverty uh, very well in Canada. Uh, but I would think the Golden Report on uh, uh, the housing situation in Toronto is a good example of uh, current, current research that shows that there are certainly poor. But, you know, child poverty is a, a politically convenient synonym mm -hmm. for family poverty. And I think when we're going to talk about this issue, we really should talk about, uh, about the family and, it, and, its, uh, and its contributing uh, uh, causes uh, or factors affecting its, its poverty level. Um, but, you know, we do have people who live in absolute poverty where, in fact, basic necessities of, of food, clothing and shelter and reasonable uh, uh, amounts of income for uh, cultural and uh, recreational and social things so that they can fully integrate and participate in the, the riches of Canada. I think these are, these are part of the debate about what is real poverty. But uh, when you see what's happening on the streets uh, of our major urban centres, uh, there's no question we have poverty in Canada. Do we have a working definition of poverty? Uh, certainly right now, the, the only thing we have that's formalized is the uh, Statistics Canada Low Income Cutoff. Uh, there is work going on now between the federal government and the provinces on what's called a market basket measure. Uh, and in fact, the United Nations has just recommended that Canada, in fact, establish an official poverty line so that we can uh, better measure it and also be accountable for the progress that we've made on dealing with it. But for, for the purpose of the discussion, what are we saying? People who can't provide sufficient food for their family? People who can't provide heat when it's cold? Is that the sort of thing we're looking at? Well, uh, Statistics Canada uh, basically describes it as uh, someone who would be uh, spending, say, 55% of their, their income mm -hmm. on basic food, shelter and clothing. It's significantly more than the average, about 20% more on those basic necessities than the average Canadian family. Mm. But if we take into account people with mortgage payments, 55%, I mean, I, I, I've, yes, I've paid 55% of my income on uh, housing, uh, rent or, or a mortgage, on food and basics, and I've never been near poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that you will find that there are going to be exceptions to the rule. In fact, uh, uh, of the people who are declared to be poor under the current uh, LICO measure, 40% uh, of them actually own their own home. Hmm. And, uh, 20, and I think 50% of those actually have no mortgage. So it's... 40% uh, it, of people who are claiming to be in poverty 
own their own home. Yes. This is interesting. Yes. Well, it, and it's because of the mathematics of, yeah. of what the low-income cutoff is. It is basically the only um, uh, uh, poverty measure, a, a relative poverty measure, which has been uh, generally available and used by major groups such as Campaign 2000 right. for some time. So at least there's a trend line or a pattern. Okay. What it means in absolute terms about fundamentals, about deprivation, um, it's not, it, there's not a very close link. Okay. I'll get to you in, in a moment, because that's a wonderful segue into you. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. What is poverty? Do we have poverty in Canada? It's a rhetorical question. I, I'm convinced that we certainly do, but uh, you may not, and that, if that's your opinion, I'd like to hear it. H have you ever lived? Do you live now? in conditions which are so poor that you believe you, you, you don't have the appropriate degree of self-respect, of, of self-dignity. If so, what do we do about it? Can the government do anything about it? We'll hear from someone later who might just say mm, it's not really for government to do. I, I mustn't predict what he's going to say. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131 on Michael Corrin Live. And uh, Laurel Rothman is the national coordinator of Campaign 2000. First of all, what is Campaign 2000? Campaign 2000 is a public education movement of about 70 groups or more across the country, quite diverse. Uh, national groups, regional groups, local groups, from the Canadian Council of Churches to uh, the Canadian Academy of Psychiatrists, the Canadian Auto Workers, um, uh, Canadian Teachers Federation, and certainly a large number of individuals who join with us. And I guess what we've come together to do is to really raise awareness about child and family poverty. And I quite agree with Paul that uh, children are poor because their families are poor. There's no sure. question about it. But that I think also in childhood, uh, it's a very important time not to lose ground and to make early investments so that we can turn around some of those um, negative uh, trends that that may occur. Um, and I and together, uh, Campaign 2000 really monitors also the progress of the federal government on the all-party resolution that was made in 1989, a unanimous resolution to seek to end. Uh, child poverty by the year 2000. That's established there is child poverty then. What are we talking about here? Uh, what, what is a, give me an example of a child living in poverty. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna pick up on what Paul said, which we really think that uh, in fact, child poverty um, is about equalizing life chances for children. Um, no, I know, but what, t give me an example of what is child poverty though. Well, but, child poverty in Canada yeah. means that you very much, you live in a family where more than 55% or more than your resources are spent on food clothing, food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is, so for example, a family of four in a large city, the, the uh, low income cutoff that uh, Paul referred to is quite a complex measure, you can argue. It's pretty uh, difficult to understand, but, but I think what we know is it resonates with Canadians. Mm -hmm. So for a family of four living in the city of Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver or Winnipeg, I think I got my population right, uh, is about between thirty-one and $32,000 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's tight to cover food, clothing, and shelter. Most places, for most people, it won't, as well as have some kind of participation in Canadian uh, life. So, for example, what we know from kids and some of the poems that they've written is that poverty means being afraid to tell your gym teacher that you don't have shoes, gym shoes. It means going without lunch sometimes once a week. I, th I thought you said the 55% um, on food, clothing, and shelter. That's quite right, and that doesn't mean that you can put food on the table every day. We also know that 40% okay. of all food bank users are children. All right, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not following this. I thought you said that poverty was when 55% of your income right. went on clothing, shelter, and food. 55% or more, that's of right. Of your income. Of your income. Well, that, that means that then you have the food, you have the shelter, and you have the clothing. You may or may not. It depends. If your income is only a thousand dollars, your income's fifteen hundred a month, and your rent is eight hundred a month, and you're a family of four, the seven hundred dollars might not cover all those things. So something goes, uh, okay. and often what goes is food. All right. So I just didn't follow the definition. It seemed okay. to me what you were saying was fifty-five poverty is when fifty-five percent of someone's income goes on three things, leaving forty-five percent for the rest of what you want to do. Um, but you're not saying that at all. I'm saying 55% or more. It, it's, it's a complex measure. Let's turn it around a different oh, way. Michael, Let, you no. know what? 
Poverty is not children starving on the street. Mm. I, I think we, sh we should all admit that. In Canada... Actually, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't 100% agree in, with in, you. In Unfortunately, we, we have more children only in my, who are in starving. in my recollection as an adult been one child in the country who ever died from starvation, and that was because of uh, parental neglect. Mm -hmm. um, but th the issue... In, in Canada should not be compared to some third world country. Yeah, We're obviously talking about a situation where um, a family in its condition might be visibly ostracized from the rest of the community because of visible signs, right. because of I can't uh, participate in the kinds of average community uh, activities mm -hmm. and, and, and recreational or cultural things. Um, I may not be able to participate in athletics because I can't afford the equipment or something like that. Um, th there are things that would ostracize yeah. or stigmatize them uh, simply because of the condition. Uh, so, so poverty we're talking about is is opportunity to fully in, mm -hmm. participate in the richness of Canada. Yeah, Talk I, about I do want to add something important. Mm -hmm. I think by and large it's true but a very disturbing trend in the last three to five years is many more children who are hungry for a small part of the time and would be hungry more often if their parents uh, weren't able to somehow resort to a food bank. So I think it is a disturbing, I'm not saying that's the majority and I quite agree we're not uh, a developing country by any means but the issue of hunger is a major one. Okay. We'll talk more about that later because although I, I'm incredibly sympathetic to the poor and I think uh, I don't certainly don't mind paying the tax I do if the, I knew the money went to the right places. I'm going to question this hunger issue because as a father of four children I know what children eat in a day and I know how how little they consume and, I, and uh, if, if a child can't eat a few slices of bread and a glass of milk which will provide a large part of its nourishment we're talking about extreme poverty. Um, let's get a, Ch uh, Chido, you're, you're a single mother, president of Mothers Against Poverty. Um, you speak from experience? Yes I am speaking from experience and as I sit down and listen to people who have spoken so far. I'm really sorry you people are really far away in terms of understanding how we live and what poverty is. Poverty for me is that I'm not on welfare but I make about $500 a month and I have four children. My rent is about $190 a month and the rest I have to pay my hydro, pay the cable and also buy the food and also supplement with the food bank. So I really don't know what you people are talking about, 55%. <laughs> Everything goes in and you still don't have enough to stretch because with food banks you can only go there once a month. So are children starving? Yes, children are starving in Canada here, okay? For my household, we cook rice and we put in the fridge and we eat rice every day, okay? But and you're talking to me. Starving. You're eating, eating rice, excuse me, you're eating rice every day, it's not every day. Before we get, you before we get going, hold on, just, before we get going on this, because we've got a break coming up, and I think uh, we should have a bit of time for this discussion. Uh, the lines are very full. We'll get to you, Colleen, Dora, Ray, Fran, Dave, the rest of you, when we come back on Michael Corrin Live on CTS. See you in a couple of minutes from now. Welcome back to Michael Curran Life. We're talking about child poverty and the point has been made and of course it is a good point that uh, child poverty is not in isolation. A child is poor if a family is poor. Uh, otherwise the family is abusive and the law should get involved but otherwise it means the family is poor, thus the child is poor. And uh, how do we define poverty? Well, we're, we're getting to that. Certainly if a, if a child has to go has to go without to such an extent that that child is marginalized, uh, is singled out, I mean, generally, we're not talking about people starving. Well, maybe we'll talk about that later. But uh, if, if a child is, uh, becomes, a, in a way, a victim in a school because he simply can't afford that. I mean, I remember going to school. I remember, I mean, it was a pretty poor area, but there were some kids who were particularly poor. And I do remember, uh, I remember one boy in particular, his mum made his clothes, certainly his shirt, and the way he was treated. And um, we're not talking about mass destruction here. We're talking about a child, though, who, who was made to cry and shouldn't really be. No, shouldn't be, should it? Uh, Chido Agalefo, you said you were earning $500 a month. Yes. You paid 190 was it? A month for rent. Where do you live for $190 a month? I live at Church and Esplanade. 
But is it, is it a room? Subsidized. Oh, I see. Subsidized. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, what, what job do you, I mean, 500 a month is not a lot of money. What, what job do you do? I work as the founder and executive director of Mothers Against Poverty. Okay. So, which would pay very badly by the otherwise it would be rather hypocritical, wouldn't it? <laughs> you, have, you have four children. I have four children. I have no idea how you manage. You cannot manage. That's when somebody says to you, that doesn't mean you're starving. You've got $500. There's no entertainment, so you have to get a uh, cable to keep the kids entertained and keep busy. Otherwise, they jump up and down. Okay, you're trying to do everything you can. You have a phone because you've got a child that's got chronic asthma, because you have to have a phone. The rest is for grocery. You ration food in Canada here, okay? I'm talking about rationing, okay? The things you eat are all junk that make you so fat, okay, that there's no nutrition. Your children have no balanced diet, okay? Eating rice every day, you don't call it starving, and there are days you don't even have that rice because you have to ration it. Well, if, if you're eating, you're eating. That's that to me. How I call not eating starving. Eat. If you, when, well, How on the days you don't eat, you might be starving, but I, I don't think that's going to address the issue. You know, when we talk about child po po poverty in the first place, we all seem to be agreed that it's a misnomer for another term, for family poverty or for, or for parental poverty or something like that. And what so why are we even using this term? Aren't we, aren't we really trying to? pull the wool over somebody's eyes because we're using this term. Why, do we, why are we deflecting our attention from where the real poverty is? You know, children don't earn money, so they can't be poverty class by definition because it's an income-based thing. Mm -hmm. And speaking from my own experience, I mean, I, I only make my money from working through Freedom Party and I make often exactly what you make. Now, I'm in a better situation because I live in a cheaper-to-live community and I'm single, so I can afford to live on much less. But uh, I have never, ever, for years, been at, the, at what has been officially the poverty line. And I think that what, what generally governments use the, the official poverty line for is as that's the, t that's the point at which we can excuse to the public that we're going to start spending tax dollars on certain poverty issues. And it just seems to me that as we've been doing this for the last 30 or 40 years, the more money we seem to be spending through government to cure poverty, the more poverty activists tell us that there is more poverty consistently. It is, do we have poverty? Call it family po poverty then. Do we have family poverty in this country? Well, a person would be a fool to say that poverty does not exist. It does exist. But is it a political issue? I don't think so. I don't think the fact that I don't have money is an issue that someone else needs to be concerned about. Now, if there's abuse going on, if there's starvation going on, if there's criminal activity going on, these are the issues that we should be concerned about and these are the issues that we should focus on. But a lack of money per se, and I've been there many times, is not yep. constitute Tell poverty. Me I mean, I've had zero money and yeah. not regarded myself in poverty. Do we not have to define what is a crime? I, I realize you're talking, talking about the criminal code, but isn't a hungry child a crime? In terms of parental per responsibility, no, I, mean, we, I, I wouldn't want to treat it as a standards. criminal matter, though. But well, uh, you mentioned you said you lived in a community earlier. Well, don't we all live in community? We're not, we're not separate individuals. Absolutely. And as we live in community, in that some people do have an enormous amount of money, sometimes purely, uh, purely by inheritance or by luck, other people don't. I'm not talking about those who don't bother to do any work, and even they deserve a certain uh, support at a certain level. But people who simply I have don't no have problem with supporting anyone as long as it's voluntary by a slight support. What are, as long as it's voluntary, what about if people don't volunteer? Well, then we can't go around with a gun forcing them to volunteer, so to speak. I, that's not a moral way about, about doing things. I mean, if we want to do something about poverty, you could put a million things on a list for me, and I'd probably support 999,999. But I will not support the one way that everyone seems to want to do it, and that's the redistribution by of wealth. redistribution of wealth through okay. the government and through taxes, because it's counterproductive. You know, here we're all talking about poverty being a lack of opportunity. Well, opportunity reduces when you have such a heavy tax load as Canada does. Um, I, I think that every person in this country should have at least a twenty thousand minimum dollar minimum tax exemption to begin with. We, no one should even have to pay any income tax until they're past that point. Well, I could agree with that. And, and to me, that would be something more productive the government could do for people who are in a lower income situation. That's not a bad idea. But what about people who earn a uh, million dollars? They shouldn't pay any tax or hardly any tax. No, they should pay the same taxes as people who pay tax. I, I believe in a flat tax rate. But, oh, I see. But whether you're a millionaire or whether you're earning forty grand. Well, once you're over. The, that minimum exemption. Right. So if it's twenty thousand dollars and everyone over twenty should pay, say, ten, fifteen percent tax. Okay. And that means a millionaire right. will pay one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the guy who's only a thousand dollars over that line will only pay a hundred dollars. So, okay. 
the rich, so I can the see rich you opening your mouth there. I know you can you can talk, you like. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I want to turn this around because no question that the definition of poverty is complicated. But I want to turn it around. There's another way to look at it. Well, are you going to respond to this man here? Otherwise, I'll do it because what I he's like saying to. is that the government can't. Oh, it isn't well, for the government certainly, to do. I, certainly we disagree, and I think we know that most Canadians disagree. There's a strong support in this country for some kind of collective responsibility. Well, Mostly, well, it's expressed through support for health care and for other Canadian values of sharing uh, and supportive communities. So then why don't we have voluntary taxation for that portion of our taxes that will go to the poor? Or why can't I as a taxpayer direct my tax dollars for poverty to go to the poverty agency of my choice? I don't think the government should be in the poverty business. I think that's for private people and churches and institutions and individuals wow. to do and that government should be the agency of last resort, not the first. I wonder whatever happened to social values <laughs> and a little bit of social responsibility. I'm speaking um, of social there, responsibility. You know, to say, well, you're poor, you're just going to have to make it alone. I didn't say that. I think, uh, I think Canadians, uh, you know, really need to in be engaged in this discussion Paul, of Paul, poverty. About I, I'm going to talk now. Um, so that, that we, we do maybe define. And, and I think what we've established here, uh, Michael, is that we don't have a consensus definition of poverty. But I can tell you, like Cheetah and I talked with Cheetah earlier um, before the show about, about her condition. And Cheetah represents people who are making a, an honest effort to not be a burden on society. Mm -hmm. But she's a lone parent. She has four children, and I'm not going to inquire about the reason why she's a lone parent. But the fact is that there are going to be pressures on this family which are going to impact the probability or the possibilities for those children mm -hmm. to fully achieve their potential. They may not have the care that they need uh, when the children need the care. We have 25% of the, the children in Canada enter adult life with significant emotional, behavioral, or social problems. This is the poverty. It's not economic poverty alone. It's mm -hmm. also a social poverty that we're trying to address. Well, let me play devil's advocate for a moment, perhaps even literally. Um, 500 a month being president of Mothers Against Poverty. People out there will be saying, well, get a different job. Get a job that pays you 1,500 a month, 1,000 a month. Again, it's hardly anything, but you'll have double your income. If you have a job, give it to me. I'll be more than happy to do it. You've heard that? You 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. What sort of work would you like to do? Do the work you do. <laughs> <laughs> I get less than 500 a month. That's good. I like that job. By the way, you won't be here when we come back after the commercial break. No, I'm just teasing <laughs> you. I'm teasing you. I, I've neglected the callers. We'll get to all of you because the lines are very full. Uh, should the government be involved in trying? I believe. I believe in redistribution of wealth. I, I, it's a principle that I, is based on, on my, my religious faith system. I'm a Christian. I believe that. Many of you aren't. Uh, your views, please. Michael Carr in live, CDS. Back in a moment from now. Welcome back, Michael Corrin Life. We're talking about child poverty, which we've established really means family poverty. If, if a child is poor, is starving, and a family is wealthy, that is the time I think we'd all agree for the state to get involved and, and charge that family with abuse. If the child is in poverty, the family is in poverty. Let's go to the lines. Colleen is on line six. Hello, Colleen. Good evening, Michael. Hello there. Hi. I, um, I have two kids, and we're living in poverty. Uh, could you just speak up a little, Colleen? Uh, well, I have two kids, and we're living in poverty. Okay. Now, tell, tell us what that means. To me, it means $190 for groceries for the whole month. Uh, two kids that are growing rapidly, that are outgrowing clothes like crazy, and you can't buy them new shoes when they come home with a hole in the shoe. <laughs> it's tough. It's really tough. Are you a lone parent? Yes, I am. I've been recently divorced. I, I, are you working, Colleen? No, I'm looking for a job, and that's another problem. You know, the, the government's saying, oh, yeah, we've got jobs going, but where? Mm -hmm. And how about child care? That must be a major issue to really be able to enter the labor force with any sort of uh, feeling of security for your kids. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I'd be willing to go and work tomorrow. Like, I, I would love to go out and work tomorrow. Like, I'll be the first one to admit it. And 
there's a lot of other people that would say, yes, I need a job, yes, where are they? But we're is, your husband, is your husband paying any child support? Well, see, that, that's going through um, the family responsibility. <laughs> He's not paying right now, no. Okay. So, Colleen, right. you're saying then that you'd rather have a job than a handout, is that correct? I would rather have a job, yeah. Well, then you're agreeing with me then, because I'm saying that if this country had lower taxes and more opportunity, we'd have more jobs. We definitely do need more employers in this country. I'm not y sure you know? we all agree with that interpretation. Robert, well, I'm I, sure you don't. Can I address? I want to answer well, you. Just one second. I want to say something Michael said here. Michael, you said that you believe in wealth redistribution and that you're a Christian, but my question to you is then, do you believe that thou shalt not steal? I or, do. Or, well, then, unless a democratic majority approves, is that no, the way it works? No, I don't believe a majority will, but I do believe in a certain uh, uh, socially moral standard. You define theft as then, someone then who... Why should oh, if, I, if I may finish, sure. I did that. You believe that theft is someone who has an enormous amount of money helping uh, uh, his brother or sister out of a crisis. I don't define that as Say theft. That again? Uh, I, don't, again. I don't so, define that as someone, theft either. Someone who has a great deal of money helping his brother or sister out of a crisis. I don't define that as theft. No, the theft you, is on your part to vote the other guy to give his money instead of giving your own why, money. It's very easy to be I generous with other people. Well, I do I, give my own money. That's fine. It's a separate issue. But through tax dollars, when we vote to vote, vote for, for uh, government poverty programs, we're basically voting, putting our vote in to make somebody else pay. That's always a general but, expectation. But actually, it's for all of us to pay so that at some point it will always be there if any of us well, needs then it. And that's why I yeah, say we should get back to a voluntary system. I must, I must, because don't let him get off like that easily. So you're saying that no one should be coerced to do anything in society? Not in the sense of meeting with someone else's expectations and their values. You have to be, but if, you if, have, I, if you make a commitment and you, right. and you default on but if that I commitment. Wanted, if, if, I, if I like your pen and I want it, may I have that pen? May I take it from you? If I gave it to you voluntarily. No, but if I took it from you, is that okay? No. Why not? Because that would be considered stealing if you took it without my consent. Who would stop me? Well, hopefully your conscience. No, but forget conscience for a moment. Who would stop me if I did it? Well, if I could, I would. Okay, and if you couldn't? Well, then no one would stop you. The police wouldn't? Oh, if somebody laid a charge or okay. something. I'm not so sure where you're going with that. So the, poli well, well, give me some time. So the police could get involved <laughs> and the courts could get involved? Yes. So you do believe the state has a right to coerce when you think it's a when, matter of morality? When it's protecting someone's private property rights and when their own property, yes. Who defines absolutely. property rights? Is property rights not the ability to feed your children? No. Property, got, property rights, not property, the ability to property is the head. right to keep what you That's earn so that no one else That's a completely arbitrary definition of what is state coercion. It's You've my definition. It. I know it is. What's exactly. yours? And, and as is your definition, it has no worth. It has to be something greater than that. My definition is shared by a great many people. And Actually, I, think I would say that the definition of community responsibility is probably from what we look at, at our elected uh, representatives in Ottawa is, is a much uh, broader shared responsibility as... Uh, See, what I'm saying is that I don't have a right to force you to support you know, my I, causes. I, I wish we could get this back That's on track a little issue. bit. We have a oh, caller. on track. We, well, well uh, but again, it, it, we're, what we're talking about, I think, is if we don't care for those who are unable to help themselves or are in straits where they, they need a hand up, not a hand up, but they need a hand up. Mm -hmm. If we don't help them, we're going to have poorer outcomes of children, which means higher health care costs, social program costs, criminal justice costs, education costs, which we all pay for. It is in our best interest to support those mm. who need help when they need but it. But Paul, the, the point that Robert has made, and it's one you'll hear made and, and see made in many of the major newspapers, is, is that we have been pouring for, for generations now money into the system. And the problem, in fact, seems to be getting worse. Now, we can talk about cuts that have been made in the last few years. Actually, they're not that important in the whole reign of things. Things have not really got that much better. The argument by libertarians is that if you liberate the tax dollars, more jobs are created, it all goes away. I'm not so sure about that. Well, okay, uh, it's a philosophy, but I'm not sure whether or not it gives some hope to people well, who what are... what you believe is a philosophy, too. Don't deny that for a minute. And, and the issue is, which is the moral philosophy? Is the, is the philosophy moral that I can force you to support some kind of social cause that I believe in? No, it's, it's, it's my, or, it's my or own social values. First of all, it's a social contract that people have uh, entered into in, in establishing Canada and over a period well, of time in the post-world. contract requires a two-sided agreement to the contract, and that's not except, what goes on. Except that you have those who are unable to help themselves. 
and when you have a vision of a country, you don't want let's, the let's gap not. between the haves and the have-nots to be so wide that you have this stigmatism and isolation of, of people in our society. We want to have a harmonious society. We don't want to put people to the point where they have to commit crimes to survive. Well, even during the Great Depression, the crime rate was not caused, didn't get that high. Right. People, I, people I want to get back to the cause. I just want to say one last thing. Mm -hmm. You're running in Ontario, the Freedom Party? Yes, we are. To win seats? Correct. If you win them, what will you do? Regarding poverty? No, no. What will you do if you win seats? Will you then have, if you formed a government, mm -hmm. would you then have a, an ideology that you would put forward? Absolutely. So you would, in fact, impose your will just as other people impose their view of a social contract now? I, you, what you're doing, you, what you're saying is that it's possible to impose individual freedom and choice on people. What I'm saying people. is, so you should be consistent no, in that's, your that's, argument. Well, no, that's, well, that's an inconsistency <laughs> in definition. We will let the viewers decide on that. Let's, Let's that. go to Dora on line three. Hello, Dora. Welcome to Michael Carr and Live. Hi, Michael and guests. Uh, hi there. Hello. I'm um, just so honored to be um, talking to you tonight. I'm a budding journalist. And to me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm surprised. Thank you. And the guests. I mean, it's so important to have a voice uh, about these issues. Um, like I was saying, I'm a budding journalist and an artist, and I'm concerned with social justice issues. And um, I sometimes feel scapegoated by the government's um, views on poverty. I have been in poverty. I've lived in poverty. And it's been a struggle just to get an education, to get food on the table. Thankfully, I hit a crisis this past year. Um, I lost my housing for school and everything. And thankfully, there was a poverty coalition backing me so I could get social assistance because I was refused many times. Um, even today, um, I feel the pressure of not having things because I am poor. I mean, there are jobs out there, and it's a constant competition, and I know that I have the abilities to get that job. But it is hard. And just a, a comment to Robert Metz. Um, sometimes it's the quality of life that people are stripped of. And sometimes people are raped of their every confidence and self-esteem there is. And I believe that um, poverty is an international problem. I mean, I have family in Italy that feel the effects. Um, I think a key is to, uh, is to participate and get involved in coalitions, to share with friends uh, problems, ang anxieties, even angers, and to share in a solution. And I think uh, a key in today's society is that government officials and people in authority are far removed from the reality of poverty. Um, they don't see firsthand what it's like to starve, what it's like to feel like your life is being stolen away, and to see your opportunities just fly by. I mean, I love this uh, specific channel. There's a song that says, Seize the Day, and I'd love to if I could. If I had the money and the opportunity, I would. And, um, I'm sorry, to, I have to move on. I'm 70, but I thank you very much for that call. That was a, a cry from the heart. Absolutely, and I think it's another call for a case to get back to voluntary help so people can get right down in the streets and see the poverty that they're helping. Mm -hmm. when, you, when we're asking government to help, we are on purpose removing it from the source of the problem. And on top of that, we're creating a whole poverty industry of people who, make, who take a lot of money from this industry in government, money that could be going to the poor. And when, on top of that, we have universal health care, we have universal education, universal everything in this country I've got that, to jump that in on this oh, one, no, no, you haven't because I've got to go to a commercial break where <laughs> um, the very acceptable face of capitalism will pay us money to put on shows about poverty and that ain't so bad Michael Corrin live CDS back in a couple of moments from now Welcome back to Michael Curran Live. We're talking about uh, child poverty, which means family poverty. And uh, just before the break, uh, Robert Metz from the Freedom Party has said that uh, things like socialized medicine and, and, uh, and education and so on are, are problems. Well, they're universal systems. You see, everything the government pays for comes from one pot. Mm -hmm. So if we want more money for education and we want more money for health care and we want more money for this and that, all of these things are competing with each other. So to place, to place poverty in the same pot as all these other things that have heavy needs placed against them places poverty recipients in a tremendous disadvantage. I have to take you on on that one, though. And I you think know, what the proof about, is before us. Well, what we know about the health of Canadians and how we get a healthy population is growing. And one thing we know is that income is a major factor as you go up the income spectrum, 
people tend to be healthier. So whatever we can do to strengthen people and strengthen their own abilities to support themselves, in a sense, helps us all have a healthy population and we keep you know, our health care costs um, uh, manageable. So I think that child poverty is related to health. Well, it, it, it certainly is, the but, but it's not. United States, where they don't have a universal health system, and in fact, they, they have, have a Medicare higher. There. They have a higher. They do not. They have uh, some limited programs for low-income families and for some seniors, but they also have at least 40 million out of 240 million people. I think is the estimated population who have no health care at all, and who, if they have an accident or something, by that you mean health care insurance. Healthcare insurance. Got to take some calls. Uh, so otherwise, I, 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 always, I tend to do this. People debating, and at the end, there are 100 people on the line, and, and they're going to get very cross with me. Ray on line two. Welcome to Michael Carr on Life. Uh, yes, good evening, Michael. I just wanted to address the specific issue of child hunger mm -hmm. and offer a solution, and yeah. that is to use the school system better. The schools right now are in a sort of an antiquated state where they think you know, children come in and go out. Um, and they never stay for lunch, which in fact they are doing all the time. And I think the solution would be to improve and expand the cafeteria systems in the elementary schools. And the schools could provide lunches and breakfast to those who wanted it and to those who fell below a certain income. Uh, they could be provided free of charge. And it would also be good for working families in general because it would meant kids could eat a proper meal at school. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a good compromise between conservatives and liberals because it would mean that money would be spent directly on feeding children. Okay. So there would be no it's a, issue. It's an interesting point. I mean, let me put this one to Rob. I, I'm, I'm 40. I was born in 1959, grew up in Britain. In 1959, uh, you, you still saw um, bomb sites, and we called them uh, prefabs, prefabricated housing, mm -hmm. from where bombs had dropped. That's part of the, uh, the price of winning the war. And uh, we had milk. Every day there was a carton of milk for us at school. And we didn't want to drink it half the time. What that was, of course, was that uh, the generation before me often many grew up with rickets and terrible uh, malnutrition, actual starvation in Britain at that time. This was a government saying, this won't happen again. You will all have this. That was a wonderful symbol, a symbol of liberation, that milk that you would have every day. You would have had another generation That's of That's what kids. Germany did before the war, twice. And yeah, it led and, them and to a world war twice. You're, you're saying milk leads to war? No, giving... The giving, reasons that led to war have nothing to do with it. In fact, Germany under Bismarck had a wonderful system of social welfare. That's not exactly the, the, my the, point. The, the, it, it was wonderful while it worked, but then when the price came to pay it, they had to default on their loans. They went to oh, war. Oh, well, that's got, nothing to do but, with providing a welfare system. Well, it's, it's to all do part with of paying it. debts after Versailles. Well, it's all part of it, but, but the social system... Look oh, at the social God. system in Canada today. Robert, if how can you say who that the Second World War was caused in part by debts and the welfare system. Well, it's, it's, it's caused by profligate government spending. It was enormous inflation. It was the Allies after the First World War being uh, treating inflation. Germany as a victim. Oh, I'm going to take another call. I'll, I'll pull my hair out here. Frank, <laughs> on line four. Frank, welcome to Michael Curran Live. Yeah, Michael, I'm glad to see you're giving concern to Canadian children and that you realize there is poverty in Canada for children. Of course. However, the point that was made there has taken care of one of my points, that the kids could be fed in school the way they did in Britain. So there's no nutritional poverty for children. The other point I have is, and this is, I'm glad to see the MP sitting there because we'll know somebody's going to Ottawa to, 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 to be aware of these problems. The other poverty is the moral poverty. BC, they're flooded with porn, child yeah, okay, porn. Frank, Frank, yeah. I do shows about that. I'm one of the few people who will take on a moral stance, but we're not talking about that tonight, Frank, okay? You know, this issue is about starvation, about hunger, about economic poverty. If you want to talk about the moral issues, we do that too, but this is not the show. I thank you for the call, Frank. Let's go to Dave on Line 7. Hi, Dave. You're on Michael Corrin Live. Good evening, Michael. Hello, Dave. I'm just calling um, because I, I wanted to address with your uh, liberal re representative there, Paul Zabo, mm -hmm. um, why the federal government's let the uh, minimum wage, Canadian one, um, fall to a level now where it's going below that of our American uh, neighbors. Good question. After exchange. All right. And um, then I'd just like to mention a, a resolution, a, a means for the provincial uh, Tories and the federal liberals to okay. uh, resolve the... Uh, the, uh, All right, but that's, let's talk about the minimum wage. I mean, the minimum wage, I believe, is, mu is much too low in this country. Uh, the minimum wage in Canada is set by the federal government for those federally regulated uh, uh, industries or segments. 
minimum wage for for, for most people uh, across the country though are set by the provincial governments, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly there's an argument. But do you know what? When you get into this, the minimum wage are reviewed regularly, and and they're they're meant to uh, provide, uh, based on certain criteria, um, a uh, a level which presumably will have a gap between social assistance and and earning. Yeah. But it's it's never it's never enough. Uh, minimum wage I is mandatory uh, compliance, which means it affects businesses, and so there's competing interests here. And and part of part of it is the social responsibility to provide an opportunity to mm -hmm. earn a, a dignified living, and the uh, push for businesses to have low. In the United States, I disagree though, in the United States, the gap between rich and poor is much larger. They do not care about the low income spectrum. They'll, they'll pay people as low as they possibly can. Uh, there's the level of concern about uh, about low income uh, in Canada is much mm. uh, much more sensitive issue. Now, I don't want to digress onto this, but you know what? This is, the Liberal government has been very big on free trade, and isn't that effectively uh, making people perhaps in Mexico work for hardly anything? Well, there's no question that when uh, uh, globalized trade and the free trade agreement NAFTA came in that in Canada we found that a lot of the entry-level jobs, a lot of the labor-intensive jobs left Canada. Mm -hmm. we, we started to get into a more um, uh, uh, high-tech, knowledge-based economy where productivity and, and uh, the richness or the growth in the GDP was going to be greater. But you're absolutely right. If you have the export of those jobs, all of a sudden entry-level jobs for young people are no longer there. You need a higher level of education. High school is no longer uh, acceptable exactly. in terms of getting a... I want, to underscore your point. I want to underscore the point about the minimum wage, though. That You know, the, the poverty line for a single parent and single child is about $21,700 in Ontario. Um, the hourly wage you need to reach that, one parent and one child, is $11.96 an hour. We know we have a $6.85 minimum wage. So people who are able to somehow, uh, who've had to rely on unemployment or social assistance and move into the labor market, go from social but assistance but poverty to labor have, market you poverty. You have to concede that in addition to the, uh, the wage, there are also uh, supplements or benefits that people receive, such as a child tax benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and, But if uh, you and don't pay your income tax, you cannot get your child tax benefit. If you don't file for your income tax, if you don't, well, to get child tax tax benefit, all you have to do is put your name on the tax return, put zero at the bottom, and send it in, and you get child tax benefit. You don't have to calculate anything if you have no income. Okay, that's kind of the call. Let's go to Ken on line one. Hello, Ken. You're on Michael Carr on Live. Even Michael, I'm a cameraman, and uh, yesterday I was watching the news. Uh, Mr. McGinty is not talking about child poverty. It's either either is Mr. Gerard Kennedy who got into an argument. In an old age senior citizens building yesterday, it was it was very very upsetting to see three grown men fighting. Uh, Ken, Ken what, what's, what's what's your question, Ken? My my question is is Mr. M if Mr. McGinty gets in and gets elected, is he going to deal with this issue? Okay, well he's not on the show, son. We don't have anyone from the provincial Liberal Party. We have a federal Liberal MP, but I do thank you for the call. Kathy is on line six. Hello, Kathy. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you. This is uh, is Rob his name? I'm sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Robert Metz from the Freedom Party. I have a question to him. He here, he's saying that he's uh, just a one person that lives on his own. I'm a single mom with two children, no child support. I do have a job. But if you had kids, you tell me how you would support your children every day. I work Monday to Friday. I have a good job. But when you don't get the extra child support that a deadbeat father does not pay, it's very hard to make ends meet. Mm. Well, definitely deadbeat fathers should be paying the bills for the children they that they produce on this They should be to do it? Well, but because they it's they a responsibility to. that they took on. It wasn't a response. Nobody forced them to become a father. That's where the beginning of the force begins. So you decide and when uh, someone is responsible and when they're not? Well, they're responsible for their actions, not for inaction. Am I not responsible for, for you if I saw you lying on the ground bleeding? Would I not be responsible to pick you up? Well, you would probably do something about it. Do you think I'm responsible? Should, should you, I? Should you go to jail if you don't? I don't think so. Okay. That's the issue when we're no, talking Robert? about government. Got a break. 416-200-3032, 905-332-3131. Mm -hmm. Back in 2.345, four moments from oh. now.
Welcome back from Michael Corrin Live. Um, gosh, this is going very quickly. Let's, uh, let's get straight to the lines. Mary is on line six. Hello to you, Mary. Hi. I'm calling because I'm probably one of the few people who does agree with the gentleman in gray. Uh, I think we're paying too many taxes. I think we're supporting too many people who are not working, are not getting up off the couch and getting a job. I used to work in a bank where people would come in and cash welfare checks and be wearing, you know, <laughs> expensive clothing, jewelry, have their kids running around, have a cab waiting outside, hurry up, cash my check so I can catch my cab and go do my errands. I'm tired of supporting people living free off the system. I don't mind paying for people who are really struggling, but unfortunately in our country today, there are too many people who really don't need the welfare and are abusing the system. And until this country finds a way to stop these abusers from getting these checks, we're never gonna we're never gonna help the child poverty that's going on in the country. Go ahead. Okay, I hear you saying that there is a lot of abuse in this country for people who are on welfare. I'm not on welfare. I am working. I'm not abusing anything or anybody. I want to work, but I do not think that you have the right to put a blanket statement on people who are on welfare, to state that everybody's a couch potato. I was on welfare I and I... she just expressed her experience. I don't think she may, gave a label because to you everybody. See, because you see two or three people who cash their welfare check at the end of the month or go drinking, there's a lot of people that have mental problems and alcoholic problems. You cannot blanket everybody we single mothers that are Nobody's struggling to that. raise That's our children. That's why we need a choice in welfare so that we can choose and decide that I want to give to the person who deserves it and I don't want the person who doesn't deserve it the not to get it. The provincial government just gave you 30% tax cut. That's what have good. you done with it? Have you given me any or anybody any? That thir tax dollars, 30% and 22% of people who are on welfare? Mary, Mary, go ahead. I'm not the one who's told these people on welfare to go out and have three, four kids. After the first child, a lot of these people are on welfare and they're having a second and a third child. Excuse me, I was married. I was married I mean, like not, the way I'm supposed to be married. She's not I getting at you. She's right. not getting at no, you. No, no, I'm here right, to give I'm example for mothers who are poor, who are on welfare or are living in poverty. You cannot be insulting us this way. But if okay? you're not collecting no, poverty, you're not even subject to what she's saying. No, 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 no. Okay. I was let, there before. Let Mary continue. Nobody's well, going to insult let people on welfare Mary again. Let Mary continue. Mary, carry on. Carry on, Mary. feel insulted by people who go out and have children and know they can't support them in the first place. I feel disgusted by people like that. You're not taking responsibility for the children in our society. Their parents are not taking responsibility for their own children. Why should I pay for their children? You cannot put a blanket statement on a minority yeah, group of people than hardworking single mothers that are raising their children. Try very hard. And that blanket statement is making me sick. And the fact that the majority of women single parents on social assistance have had partners. The majority did not come on as uh, sole support parents with but, but no other parent. What, Mary, the, what, about I, the caller? what about the okay, caller? May I address, Mary, if I may just address you for a second. It, it must be very annoying. You're working in a bank and you see someone come in and there are abusers, yep, and they're cashing the check and they, you don't get much money if you're on welfare. So if they're dressed in this expensive way and have a cab, they're also they're breaking the law because they're getting money elsewhere. But we're talking about a very small minority and the fact is if you are a single mother on welfare, you ain't got very much at all. Honestly, Mary, believe me, there is not much there. So I know the personal, the anecdote, the experience can make you bitter, but you're talking about a small minority of people. I don't see that's the problem. A lot of the people who do have money don't see that. They see the abusers out there. They're the ones who are out and, you know, they get caught and they see that and they don't want to pay anymore. We're fed up of paying I taxes. Understand. Mary, it, it's unfortunate that sometimes media concentrates on, on the cases where people are abusing and not the vast majority where they're barely getting it together. And I, mean, well, I think the issue is if Mary was not forced to support a charity she wouldn't otherwise force, there wouldn't be an issue here. She wouldn't be complaining how, about anyone. Well, I guess, but Mary, I don't know your situation. I don't want to ask, but perhaps one day in the next five years, you yourself may at some point not have a job. I don't know if you have children, but there are people in that situation who have nowhere else to turn That's and right. really need the social safety net. I appreciate the call, Mary. I, I do understand where you're coming from, but you know, sometimes if we just stand back a bit and consider, um, 
the idea that, uh, and I think the construction that we were hearing from you was, they are all, or I believe, I don't want to pay because, is a bad one. But I appreciate the call very much. Let's go to J uh, Jody on line three. Hello, Jody. Welcome to Michael Corrin Live. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Good. Uh, that's good. He's obviously talking to you. I guess so. I am. Um, How are it you? It's actually him who caught my interest. He, um, and you did well with your excellent example of the pen, Michael, because he wanted to use the police to protect his pen. Well, he wants to lower taxes to increase business. Well, any smart businessman knows that if he has a good tax accountant and a good tax lawyer, he can put his money away from the taxes, freeing it up into his business, creating more income, thus freeing it for himself to give to the charities he wants to, and they will manage the money the way he wants. So instead of saying that we have to lower all of our taxes to increase business, we have to educate people on how to use their money. Okay, thanks for that call, Jody. Certainly um, a valid point. I'm sorry? Certainly a valid point. Okay. Martin on line five. Hi, Martin. Uh, yes, hi. A first-time caller. Great. Uh, yeah, my gr I just thought I'd say uh, my grandfather came here uh, when he was 10 and uh, learned English, and he was dirt poor, and that was before uh, welfare was around. And he had to uh, be very hungry and go to university, and uh, it was during the Depression, so uh, he did make it to university. And uh, today, I don't think that could happen. With our education system, the way it's set up, you can't. Uh, people are, are not able to, to move up. It's very difficult just to uh, see people that uh, have to be on OSAP and uh, struggle through and, and get out of the circle of poverty. And, and I don't think there's one answer. I think that uh, society has to admit there's a real problem and not, not to uh, uh, depend on political uh, and golden reports uh, that have been done already. I think it's the uh, community as a whole. Bigger picture has to, I think we have to look at the bigger picture. Okay. Martin, I appreciate the call. Good first time call indeed. Uh, Peter is on line two. Hello there, Peter. Hi, I'm Michael Corn. Uh, it's good to speak with you. Uh, these liberals make me absolutely sick. Uh, you know, there's a whole industry of people making a living off the welfare industry. They, uh, they're sitting around you there, but beside the point. Uh, when you look at, you know, you can buy bread for 10 cents a slice, eggs are 14 cents each, cereal 15 cents a serving, milk 15 cents a glass. We're blessed in this country. Yeah. You know, we talk about people that are living below the poverty line of 21,700. Uh, you've got to recall that there's so many people that are part of the underground economy. Yeah. They deliberately produce figures to the government. Yeah, well, Peter, Peter, hold on a minute, Peter, there are some who are, and there are many, many who aren't. But hold on a minute, I mean, you, you made a comment about these two people, they have a right to defend themselves, that you're making a living out of uh, the welfare industry. He was referring, I think, to you two. Well, I hardly think there's a welfare industry. I think that there are active citizens and volunteers across the country who express their concerns about lots of things. And in our case, it's uh, more than 70 groups concerned about child poverty who really see uh, shared responsibility is a core Canadian value when they worry a paid about position? it. Mine is a paid position. We receive donations. We receive some contributions from foundations, and we're uh, independent. What were you non -profit. doing before? Before this, you were doing what? I've done a number of things. I've worked in government. I've worked um, in the voluntary sector. I've been a volunteer. I've been a parent. So right. I've done a number of things. Okay. And Cheeto, are you making a living uh, off of the backs of the poor? I make five hundred dollars a month, but I put two hundred computers a year into the homes of those living in poverty, get them connected to the computer, train them, and help them to get jobs. Their kids use the computers to do homework, mm -hmm. and also the, the mothers use the computer to set up home-based business, so they're able to look after their children. I'm not making money off the backs of the poor, but there are people making money off the backs of the poor. There are billions of dollars donated to charities. Why is it not getting to us? Okay. All right, Michael Curry live on CDS. We'll be back in a couple of moments from now. Well, yeah, we're out of time again. Uh, on the issue of child poverty, we will do this show again. It's too important not to, and will we get to any answers? I don't know. But I, I would like to thank Laurel Rothman and Chido Agalafo and Robert Mebs and Paul Zabo, and I'd love to debate you one-on-one -on -one at some point, sir. Wonderful. 
And tomorrow night, uh, we'll be back with, oh, we've got a special new panel, new uh, media panel. It'll be very, very exciting. Take care. God bless. Goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow. And I hope you're not in any sort of poverty. Bye-bye.